welcome to our conclusion of this commentary trilogy on the three concepts of the uncanny, the grotesque, and objection. This one is about Julia Kristeva and her concept of abjection. Okay, so as per usual, uh, whenever I give a video commentary of this sort, I'll always try to do a little biographical information just to give you some context. Uh, so Julia Kristeva was born June 24th, 1941 in Sleven, Bulgaria. Happily, she is still with us today, unlike Freud and Mikhail Bakhtin, the subjects of the previous two videos. Kristeva is still alive and she's still working. Right? Uh, she immigrated via her studies to France in the 60s and there she stayed. She would stay in France and she's closely associated with French intellectualism. Uh, she's, a she's a psychoanalyst, a critic, a novelist, an educator. She's best known for her writings in structuralist linguistics, psychoanalysis, semiotics. Semiotics, if you don't know what that means, it's in brief, it's the study of signs and symbols and how they operate in society. Uh, and then she was also involved in philosophical feminism, at times critically so. But the essay that we read is taken from a book called The Power of Horror, in which she explores the subject of abjection in much greater detail than either we read about or that we are going to discuss here. Uh, our goal here is just simply to develop a working understanding of the concept of abjection, such as she theorized it, uh, just to serve as a jumping off point into analysis of some of the stories and poems that we've already, that we've already begun reading with uh, Carmilla and which we will continue reading going forward. We'll try to see how some of these themes, these concepts apply to all of the works that we're reading essentially. So uh, it's important to keep in mind the uncanny, the grotesque and abjection. We will try to talk about at least one of these in connection to every work that we that we read going forward. So make sure that you have some kind of uh, at least rudimentary understanding of what each of these concepts mean. And we'll try to continue to clarify what they mean through the application of them to the various works. Now, in the strict sense, abjection arises before language is applied to that which triggers the feeling, the fear that Christopher calls abjection. She says, when I am invaded by abjection, this torsad, so a torsad is kind of a twisting ribbon. Uh, that's It's kind of an ornamental twisting ribbon. You might see it on a hat or something like that. Uh, when I am invaded by abjection, this torsad made of thoughts. So we have this idea of, of all these winding, these thoughts winding around each other. This, uh, this sort of explosion of thoughts that are wrapping around each other. When I am invaded by objection, this torsade made of thoughts to which I give this name does not have, strictly speaking, any definable object. The object is not an, sorry, the abject is not an object in front of me that I name or imagine. So an object, is basically the way she's using it, which again, uh, should be taken with a grain of salt because she writes in, in a very poetic style at times, such that a lot of the words that she uses signify in different directions. In other words, there's this almost kind of wordplay that's happening in her writing so that we can read the words in different ways. Uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, but the most direct way that she's using the idea of an object is that an object is something to which a person relates. Uh, for example, if you say, I love my mother, I'm afraid of tigers. I want to be like Mike. Uh, in that case, mothers, tigers, and Mike would all be objects to you. They would be internalized concepts of people and things in the outside world. So drives like those for sex, hunger, and affection, they have objects. And object relations theory, which is basically a branch of 
psychology. Objects are usually persons, parts of persons, or symbols of one of these. So basically, once something is articulated, uh, crystallized, if you will, into an object, the subject or the self, that is the thing that says I, is positioned in relation to that object. Whereas abjection occurs when such defining coordinates begin to disintegrate. The abject does not tangibly represent anything in a clear emotional sense to the subject, to the self. When experiencing abjection, our conception of ourselves is threatened with collapse. It becomes hard to distinguish our ego, our personality, from that which we have thrust out of ourselves. So let's say you see a turd, a human turd on a sidewalk, and consider it in a scientific sense. That is, if you can attach some distinguishable reason for that turd, that piece of poop being there, you might feel grossed out and you might feel a biological repulsion, a, a physical repulsion, because our, our chemical makeup, you know, sort of dictates that we should be turned off by such things for the evolutionary reasons of health and so on and so forth. Uh, you, so you might feel a biological, physical repulsion, but that isn't quite abjection. It's not abjection because you can explain it. You can place this turd in relation to yourself and you can contemplate it and consider it in a rational way. But if you just see that turd on the sidewalk and you can't explain it in a social order, such as you have conceived that social order, if that turd triggers in you a whirling sense of being pulled in by everything you believed that you had cast out of yourself and made separate from yourself in order to give subjective form to yourself, then that is abjection. Kristeva writes, to each ego, it's object. To each superego, it's abject. This is not the white sheet or full calm boredom of repression, nor the versions and conversions of desire plaguing bodies, nights, and discourses, but a brutal suffering which I, sublime and ravaged, makes the best of. For I attributes it to the Father. I put up with it, for I imagine that such is the desire of other. This massive and abrupt eruption of a strangeness which, if it was familiar to me in an opaque and forgotten life, now importunes me as radically separated and repugnant. Not me, not that, but not nothing either. A something that I do not recognize as a thing. A whole lot of nonsense which has nothing insignificant and which crushes me. At the border of an inexistence and hallucination of a reality which, if I recognize it, annihilates me. Here, the abject and abjection are my safety railings, seeds of my culture. So if you watch the Freud commentary, or if you're just familiar with Freud's tripart model of the psyche, that is, of uh, the id, the ego, and the superego, then you'll know that ego is the surface level personality that arises from the conflicting dynamic of the id, which is the subconscious animalistic urges in brief, uh, and the superego, which is the, which is composed of the socially acquired control mechanisms that have been internalized, aka your conscience, aka the police force of your mind. The ego moves in relation to its objects, either towards them or from them. But the superego merely negates and relegates aspects of the external world to the realm of the abject, beyond clear understanding, or even the will to understand completely. So that makes it different from the kind of repression associated with Freud's idea of uncanny, because that kind of repression has an object. The mother, the father, we can blame them. We can blame the mother or the father for this or that neuroses, you know, for our, for our oral fixation, for our anal fixation, uh, for our fear of castration, what have you. There's something that we can root those 
sorts of fears and and that's more closely related to the uncanny uh, but the abject cannot be located in a clearly bounded mental formation and by the superego it might even be forced outside the bounds of mental formations because we cannot bear to acknowledge it in some cases we cannot bear to confront something that society has deemed improper we cannot bear to confront it when an external trigger sets off a torrent of thought that threatens to show us that something inside ourselves so we thrust it out abject it refuse to recognize it so the question becomes to what degree is society held together by its refusal to recognize the real and i wanted to share with you this uh fragment from Beowulf, this section where I think, I think it illustrates this idea very well. Uh, so if you've never read Beowulf, um, at this point what's happening is that Beowulf and all of his friends, they are at this banquet hall uh, called Hero, and they're all partying, they're all having a good time, um, they're all, you know, they, they've all been to battles and come back, and they're celebrating and they're sort of you might read hero the banker the banquet hall as uh signifying as symbolizing society they're all together in their society that they've constructed they're safe they're secure and something disrupts that and that something is a fiend out of hell that began to work as evil in the world grindle was the name of this grim demon haunting the marches marauding around the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because the Almighty made him anathema. And out of the curse of this exile, there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and the giants too who strove with God time and again until he gave them their reward. Right, so we have here uh, in Grindel. Grindel is this monster who begins assaulting the banquet hall where all the people are eating, dining. And basically, uh, Cain, if you know the story from of Cain and Abel from the Bible, Cain kills Abel. It's kind of like the first murder. So everybody, all of the, off, the offspring of Cain became monsters, became anathema, slime. They're something other than human. There's something outside of society, something that society won't even recognize, other than as slime, as monsters, as as uh, you know, something without identity, basically. Grendel has a name, but he's something other. He's He's not a human. He's abject, right? He's ab he's the abject manifested in the form of a murderous monster coming to break down the boundaries of society, to break into this banquet hall where everyone is feasting and their presumed security, and he begins murdering and eating people and destroying everything that they thought was solid and defined. I can consider the similar effects of the corpse, which Kristeva says, in this insistent thing, raw, so as, that's, that is a corpse she's talking about, which she considers a kind of pure form of objection. In this insistent thing, raw, insolent, under the bright sun of the room at the morgue, crammed with adolescents who have lost their way. In this thing, which no longer demarcates, and thus no longer has any meaning, I contemplate the collapse of a world which has effaced its limits, fainting. The corpse seen without God and outside science is the height of abjection. It is death, infesting life, abject. It is something rejected from which one is not separated, from which one is not protected, as is the case with an object, an imaginary strangeness and a menace that is real. It calls to us and finishes by devouring us. So without God, 
and outside science is the key phrase here. Once we shroud the corpse in an ideological framework or examine it and its parts individually and mechanically, we can objectify it and we can deal with it in that way. We can remove it from ourselves. But when we face it in and of itself, we are faced with the reality which subsumes us. We are threatened with the realization that in the materiality of our existence, we are not in fact separate from this thing. The borderlines of our being break down. And so we thrust this presence out of our recognition. It becomes the other in order that we might preserve the fragile dimensions of the self and society. And we have here this scene from Othello, uh, with Iago whispering into Othello's ear. So if you've ever uh, read or seen Othello, Iago is this sort of manipulating little worm of a villain. He's one of the most notorious villains in all of literature. He's, he's a liar. He manipulates Othello and, and tricks him essentially into, into murder, into carrying out murder. He's working within the boundaries of the kingdom, basically, of the court. Um, and this is important because Christeva says, it is not an absence of health or cleanliness which makes something abject, but that which perturbs an identity, a system, so just like that corpse, uh, which perturbs our definitions of what it means to be alive, right? Uh, that begins to break down because we're bound to that thing that is dead in our material existence. Just so, that which perturbs our identity, a system, and order, that which does not respect limits, places, or rules. It is the in-between, the ambiguous, the mixed, the traitor, the liar, the criminal with a good conscience, the rapist without scruple, the killer who claims to save all crime because it indicates the fragility of the law is abject, the premeditated crime, sly murder, hypocritical vengeance are still more so because they emphasize this exhibition of legal fragility. He who refuses morality is not abject. There can be grandeur in the amoral and even in a crime which proclaims its disrespect for the law, a crime rebellious, liberating, and suicidal. But abjection is immoral, murky, devious, and suspect. A terror which is dissimulated, a smiling hatred, a passion which abandons the body instead of inflaming it, a man in debt who sells you, a friend who stabs you in the back. So someone who stands opposed to morality, who stands outside of morality, what we might call in the strict sense an outlaw, is not exactly abject. In fact, they might even be heroic in a certain way. And we have heroic outlaws in our society, right? I mean, um, you know, the way that we sort of almost fetishize uh, certain gangsters, right? Tony, Tony Montoya, uh, Bonnie and Clyde, um, Don Corleone, the Godfather, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, what have you. We have these sort of outlaws that we put on these pedestals, and it's because they, they stand in opposition to the dominant order. Uh, but a character of that sort can be located. They can be clearly recognized. They can be confronted within ideological structures. They are not precisely abject. Rather, it is the criminal who works to corrode these structures altogether who is abject. The criminal who makes us doubt that they are separate from us in their capabilities. The truly abject criminal is one who threatens us with the realization that we are an accomplice to their crime. And so the criminal must be thrust out and becomes an exile who says where, an outcast, the other, a voyager in an endless night, a lost soul, a wanderer in an ever-changing space. And this is the realm of all that is made abject. This is the realm of the monster, in fact. So obviously, Kristeva's conception of abjection 
is much more complex than this video might suggest. Um, the point of this is just to solidify a basic understanding of the concept, just as with the, pre two, uh, the previous two videos, it's not to give a complete thorough breakdown of these writers, these thinkers, or these concepts that we're dealing with. But it's meant to be a starting point, a working model, a working concept, uh, a working understanding of these concepts, rather. And we will spend much of the semester going forward expanding on these farther, challenging these conceptions of these ideas by these thinkers uh, through our reading of works of literature and seeing how an understanding of these concepts can somehow give us a deeper understanding beyond the face value of those works of literature, those stories and poems that we will, will, that we will be reading. But I want to finish this commentary by reading a poem, one of my favorites, a very short one, that I think embodies some of these ideas. But I'm going to just read it without comment and let you dwell on it and think about it. It's called In the Desert, and it's by a guy named Stephen Crane. And it goes like this. In the desert, I saw a creature, naked, bestial, who, squatting upon the ground, held in his heart his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good, friend? It is bitter. Bitter, he answered. But I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. Good night.